Hey y'all, I'm Ash Vampire, and you're watching Shoring Up. So this week on Shoring Up, we are of course going to be continuing our look into the key trinity of visual novel adaptations, this week tackling canon. Now, canon is interesting for a lot of reasons and one of the more difficult things that you have to consider when i don't want to say analyzing canon because that's obviously not really what we're doing here but canon had an interesting problem to overcome in that it was positioned between air and then clanad which would come after and air has such a more esoteric tone in terms of how it tells its story that you know i discussed last week and clanad is significantly critically beloved like it is in the top 100 anime of all time on mal and you can discuss whether or not mal scores have any relevance as to the quality of a show but it does indicate that a lot of people really like clanad particularly after story so when you have canon and you have to like look at canon, you have to think, okay, well then how does canon sell itself apart? How does it sell itself when it's between one before it, very distinct, very different, just in terms of anime in general, and then on the other side, it's got one that just everybody loves. Canon chooses to do this in a couple ways, which we are going to get into when we look at uh the show in this whole review thing that we're doing here but one of the more interesting ones that it really really goes deep on really dives into is the supernatural elements and i said before that you know air can and clanad all have supernatural elements that you know kind of pervades their uh, their identity as being you know key visual novel adaptations but canon really ramps it up and makes it almost an integral part of the story that it has to tell whereas air is a lot more like just strange and you could almost argue that it's a perception thing like the characters are perceiving these elements as being supernatural but because of how ill-defined they are within the context of the show it really could be just uh you know explained away you know scientifically you could make that assumption possibly and in Clanad, it, it seems very tacked on. But canon is very, it has a magical element integral to its plot. You know, you've got Mei, who has literal healing powers. You've got Makoto's entire arc is based in, you know, magic. And then you have Ayu, who is like the crux of the entire show and her entire arc is based on this very poignant use of the idea of the dream as being a little bit more than just you know the things that happen to you at night you know there's a lot more of a literal interpretation and a more supernatural interpretation of what dreams actually are so it it also has other things that it does which we're going to go into here in a bit but it is very interesting to see how canon is like, how do I sell myself? How do I make myself stand out between two shows that are very well known for, you know, completely different reasons, but either way. Uh, so let's get into the rest of what canon does in terms of how it makes a name for itself. One of the things about canon that immediately stood out to me within like the first couple episodes is the setting. And I'm not talking about the city itself. The city itself is kind of plain, kind of boring. It really has no real impact on the plot. What's interesting about the setting is the fact that the entire story takes place in the shows or in the town's wintertime period. And this has a lot of potential that canon utilizes in terms of, you know, metaphorical imagery that are very unique to, you know, the wintertime setting and the ideas of snow and, you know, rebirth after, you know, winter. But it also uses it for making the flashbacks that happen look visually distinct because they're not set in, in the wintertime. But the thing that just stood out to me is that wintertime is kind of seen in a lot of shows as a more transient type of like time period you know if a show does show more than one season usually winter is not going to be like 
sticking around for any longer than any other, you know, any other season. It's just a very interesting way to visually set itself apart. Because even though you do see wintertime in Clannad, you never see it in air. You know, air is based in the summertime. But it just immediately calls out to me that they are all, they are already thinking about the fact that they have to set themselves apart visually. And just the way that they play with colors, you know, the way that they use the fact that snow reflects a lot more light than, you know, anything else, you know, in, in terms of the seasons it's a very distinct thing you know they play with oranges and reds and purples in the sunset you know they they have the glint of the sun off the snow you know, they they really really use everything in the setting to the maximum advantage and they create a lot of beautiful backgrounds when they do it and i appreciated that and i thought that it was a really interesting you know a really interesting choice which i'm pretty sure you know the entire visual novel was also set in you know the winter time but that's beside the point. It's very interesting to to me to be able to, you know, go through a lot of, you know, romance or slice of life shows and have wintertime be, you know, the Christmas episode or, you know, it's only two episodes long in a lot of cases. No, canon is set entirely during the wintertime. And I really appreciate that. I think it's very uh it's very distinct. It's very interesting to 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 have a show do that. And, to, and for it to not get boring, you know, like I said, they play with the color palette that snow uh, and the chillness of the atmosphere really offers. And it's uh, it's really good. It, it's really interesting. It's really good. And, you know, if you're into like just different types of backgrounds, uh, I think this is would uh, this would appeal. Uh, but also, you know, like I said, air is set, you know, entirely during summertime and by and large, in a lot of ways, like spring and summer are kind of represented in terms of their color palette almost the same way falls sometimes you get that color change of you know the leaves but not all the time so it's it immediately like, yeah, I, I can't say it enough it immediately sets itself apart and you immediately know that you're watching canon because there's snow on the ground everywhere so uh for that alone it would i think draw attention to itself uh which you know is the challenge that it does have to overcome You know, we're going to look at a lot of comparisons uh, between Canon and Air in this video. And one of the ones that should be immediately obvious is that Canon is twice as long as Air. But that is not actually like something that it has in, in terms of advantage. Because even though Canon is twice as long as Air, it has so much more going on in terms of character development. You know, plot is a, the plot is a lot stronger and a lot more driving in terms of the show. So, even though it is twice as long, it has a lot more to do, and it almost has too much to do. You know, the double time length is almost not enough. So, canon has to condense a lot of what it has to get done, even though it is longer, and it does this in a very interesting way because they don't have as much time as is really necessary to really develop these characters to the maximum extent that is that they actually need they resort to the use of flashbacks which i mentioned in you know my discussion on the setting and in my video uh my scripted video about the differences between canon and clannad after story in terms of how they use deus ex i talk about how the flashbacks are used to use the language of that video as a proxy to the actual events in the show, particularly between Ayu and Yuichi, because you've got all these different character interactions going on, so they can't really fully devote all the time that they absolutely would necessarily need to to the main couple of Ayu and Yuichi. So in order to develop that to a point that you actually feel something to, you know, toward these two characters and want to actually see them happily together, they use flashbacks in order to kind of build their relationship even though nothing's actually happening in the present. It's a very clever use of it. And on top of this, the flashbacks also act as thematic loops to always be there. You know, the episodes always open with Ayu narrating about the dream and then you have the flashbacks which are always also there reminding you of the importance 
of the dream. And it's never explicit. Canon never really tells you why this is so important, but it keeps it very, very much in the forefront of your mind throughout the entire show's run. And it's just a very clever use of how to condense character development into a much shorter time span than you would typically need for this kind of story to work effectively. So, so canon, not air, so canon being a key adaptation of a visual novel, just like all of the others, has to deal with, you know, the fact that there are multiple arcs, or, or multiple paths, rather, if we're discussing it in visual novel terms, multiple ta paths for the main character to go down in terms of the romance options with the girls, and each one handles it slightly differently, and I think canon does it best. The way the air does it is to just kind of, like as we discussed in the last video, just kind of buy the numbers, you know, meet girl, deal with problem, and never see them again. Now in Clannad, it kind of just front loads all of the side characters or all the side girls' stuff into the very beginning so that you can then have everything else, you know, happening afterward be just about Nagisa and Tomiya. But Canon does something completely differently. It actually mixes every single character arc into the exact same timeline. And what I mean by this is that no Yuichi does not meet all of the girls in like a sequential order. He just meets all of them and is interacting with all of them and dealing with all of their issues simultaneously. And this does a couple very important things that I think puts canon up above and over the bar in terms of quality. On the one hand, what this does is this makes Yuichi himself seem like a much more real and dynamic person. It doesn't feel like fate has kind of laid out his path for him or, you know, the writers or whatever you want to call it. He feels very much like he's just experiencing life and moving through life and dealing with things as they happen and isn't sort of hyper-focused on any one of the characters, because how could you be? You know, how could a regular person just kind of meet someone, learn about them, and just completely ignore them until someone else's problems are taken care of? So this makes him, like I said, into a much more dynamic and realistic person. And it makes, and that in itself makes him a lot more interesting to, you know, associate with yourself with like you can kind of get into his headspace a lot more easily as a viewer now on top of this it makes all of the other characters all the side characters feel a lot less like side characters you don't feel like any of the all of any of the girls in canon are like sidelined into that side character role because in addition to yuichi interacting with all of them at the same time by virtue of that they're interacting with each other all the time their plot lines, you know, intersect and, and you know, cross in multiple very interesting ways. And it just honestly makes all of the characters feel alive. They feel real. And it's just a very refreshing way to handle this kind of, you know, issue that is very unique to visual novel adaptations, you know, granted. But I personally like this. And this is part of why I personally fell in love with canon in terms of the characters is why I actually enjoy all of the characters because they never feel like they're isolated and contained to the one box that is their arc. They all interact with each other and they all feel part of this one collective town. I love this part of canon and I think that it really elevates all of the characters just, you know, that just that little bit above what you typically see in visual novel adaptations and even for you know in large part what you see in a lot of shows you know uh canon in this department really sells itself well and uh is is great in terms of you know how it develops its characters in relation to each other so now i want to talk about the pacing of canon because this is directly tied into how it handles all of its character storylines and how they intersect, like I said. Because canon is a master of slow burn pacing. Canon is... Ooh. Canon is very, very slow. It very much takes a lot of time. It really drags itself out. And under normal circumstances, 
this would be annoying. It would be irritating. You know, you would just be like, oh, would you just get on with it? You know, I really just want to see how these characters, you know, relationships end. You know, where where are they going? You know, do they find what they were looking for? You know, whatever it happens to be. You just kind of typically would want that to just be over and done with so you could move on. Now, canon counteracts this by not... Be, be, because all of the characters are having their stories happen all at the same time, this means that no one of the characters can actually have their arc just you know, run full pell-mell down the, you know, the narrative path in one, you know, continuous stream. It means that you, the audience, are sort of drip-fed, you know, these little tiny interactions between either each other or Yuichi. And what this does is this makes it feel a, a lot, not nearly as slow as it actually is. Man, these sunglasses, dude, they keep getting caught on my huge forehead. Anyway, the 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 interesting part about this is by nature of that drip feed you never get bored it doesn't matter how slow canon is because let's say that you're not 100 percent into the story of you know ayu and yuichi let's say that you really care a lot more about say shiori's story right you're never just sitting around waiting for something to happen with shiori She's sprinkled into all, you know, all throughout the show. And, and her arc concludes at about the same time as almost everybody else's. So effectively, what this does is this keeps you invested in the show on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. As opposed to looking, you know, super far ahead in terms of, you know, what is the, you know, end goal. Because you have so many different things to be carrying out at any given time. On top of this, this also allows canon a far greater control over how it delivers its catharsis because they know that you, the audience, are not 100% zeroed in on any one of these characters. And it just really helps when their catharsis moments for all of them do happen, you're kind of really able to experience it without having had that much forethought go into it. You know, you may have had a moment or two where you were able to you know, think about, okay, well, you know, where is this character's story leading? But by and large, you haven't really had the chance to really invest a lot of thought into each of the character's stories because, like I said, you're on that moment-to-moment -moment investment level. So when the endings do finally come, they feel just as shocking as the show presents them to be. It's an amazing, amazing mastery of how to do slow pacing. And I love it. I love it. I love, uh, you know, I generally like you know, slower shows, and you could also argue that, you know, this kind of moment-to-moment -moment investment in each of the characters in terms of, like, a drip feed of their stories is probably more true to the source material of the visual novel, but either way, it really, really just delivers their catharsis so much better and allows the show's creators a far greater level of control over how you experience that catharsis, which is super important in a show like this because that's all it is. That's all it's building up to. So, you know, fantastic use of, you know, pacing and, you know, to control how the audience ends up feeling about any of the characters at any given time. You know, one of the things about canon that I love so much is how all of these points that I've talked about so far really feed into each other. They build on each other and they complement each other to make canon just that much more enjoyable, that that you know that much more engaging and also lend it a you know real sense of purpose you really get a sense of the people behind it the people who are making it had a very clear vision and you know clear understanding of you know not only what they were trying to do but also of how to pull it off and going off of that let, let's talk about the ending of canon specifically about the pacing because we just discussed exactly how canon manipulates the pacing of the show in you know an overall sense but the ending is completely different than the rest of the show. Because with canon being so slow, it really keeps its secret, of, uh, it, the secret in terms of like how it's going to end, very close to its chest, far more than air and definitely far more than Clannad because Clannad just eff effectively just calls it out uh, you know, blatantly, you know, doesn't even try to hide it like air. 
So what does this do? This allows them to completely manipulate how you are feeling when the ending happens. So the way they do this is that you are at the end, then bam, the tragedy happens. Everybody realizes what's what IU's deal is. She realizes it and disappears. Yuichi is you know, overcome with exactly what is going on. Everyone is just trying to scramble and figure out what's, you know, what's happened. You know, they're trying to get a grip on the reality of what they have just experienced. And you as the audience feel the same way. Why? Because as soon as the tragedy happens, Cannon's pacing just rockets straight into the stratosphere. It accelerates to an unbelievably fast pace in delivering not only information, but character development. Everything is just slammed together and hurled out of a catapult. And it kind of scrambles your brain a little bit. And this is all done to maximize your understanding of what Yuichi himself is going through because he's going through literally the same thing you're sitting there and you're trying to piece together all of these you know puzzle pieces that canon has just dumped onto your plate and you're trying to put them all together and figure it out and make sense of everything that is going on but at the same time you're also trying to figure out like oh no i'll be like this completely retextualizes everything that i've watched in canon up to this point it is amazing but then to make it even better and to really put a capstone on it as soon as we get to the moment of catharsis in canon, it pulls on that handbrake and screeches right back to the slow burn that we have experienced through the rest of the show, as like a callback almost. And in addition, this allows you as the audience member to once you've just, just as you've come to grips with what's happened, just as you've put all those puzzle pieces together, you have the full picture and you actually understand now, well now you get to enjoy this nice, slow, sweet realization that Yuichi and Ayu are happily together, and then it ends. It is absolutely beautiful. Not just from an emotional standpoint, because the catharsis delivery here is, un is just godly in how well it's done. But it is beautiful from a technical and analysis and narrative perspective as well. I have never seen a show do such a good job with reaching its climax, delivering it, and then also just continuing on and right down to the very end, making you feel satisfied. It is amazing. And I, I would be hard pressed, I think, to find a show that does as good a job as canon does for me, right? Like, I understand that a lot of what I'm saying here is very much couched in how much I personally like canon. And I also am aware that a lot of that comes down to buying into the characters. And I think I've made a good case as to why it is a why you are able to do that. But, you know, visual novel adaptations are certainly not for everyone and romance is definitely not for everyone. But I just the, the ending is so powerful and so just the craftsmanship that went into it is just on on a completely different level and i think it's really one of the highlights of the show even even though it is you know obviously it's the ending so typically the endings are highlights of shows but still uh you know outside of the fact that it is the ending it is probably one of the best parts of canon overall and with that we have come to the end of the shoring up on canon I love canon, if that were not already, you know, already ludicrously obvious. I adore this show. I love all of the characters. I, the setting is gorgeous and interesting to me, obviously. That's what, that was like my first point. And I love all of the character dynamics. I love how complex and yet fluid that complexity is, you know, delivered, um, you know, we, are, we just got done talking about the ending. I think that's amazing. Um, Canon is hands down the best thing that I watched in the past eight months while I was away out of the country. And I, 
when when you're scoring hot you know shows that you like or you're talking about shows that you like it actually i think i've talked about this on a shoring up before it's very difficult to have more words to say that really encompass just how much the you know that particular piece of media means to you and uh, the only way that i can effectively do it now here is that we're at the end is to say that i give canon a nine and i 100 percent recommend everybody watch it even if you're not you know you know hard sold on romances um go go watch canon have a good time you know appreciate all of the craftsmanship and the the understanding uh general general mastery that you know it displays from its creators so so with that said i'll catch you on the flip side <laughs>